what we do is called a progressive relaxation where we start the forehead and we work down to the feet. It takes about 10 minutes, but once you're done, you feel really, really relaxed. If you're having a stressful day, do the slow paced deep abdominal breathing that I showed you. Get those endorphins released. Do some relaxation. That breathing technique, by the way, will follow you through the rest of your life. If you're in a stressful situation at work, if you're in bumper to bumper traffic, if you're a parent that needs time out from your kids, we want you to breathe. Okay, because people say count to 10 or 20. No, when you're done, you're still ticked. But if you do, take the time to do at least 10 of those nice long inhales and exhales, those endorphins begin to be released. You physically calm down and you can handle the situation better. Okay, so learning how to relax is the key. I'm sure many of you go to bed, you plump up your pillow and you realize you're still not on the pillow. You're still holding things up and we need to learn how to really sink into the pillow. Okay, so a couple different positions. Sitting up or lying down is the best way to do this. And the best way is to have partner up against the wall and then mom leaning against the partner. Because I'll have you sit against these pillows against the wall. You. Yeah. Okay. And turn around, sit down. Hopefully you won't hit your head on there. Okay. Now, with this one here, what I'm going to have you do is sit down and lean against him. Nice and comfortable. Got it? Nice and easy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, and once again, make sure the pillow comes up behind her head just a little bit. So you want to put your head back all the way, just like that. Okay, nice and relaxed. And again, the whole idea is to make sure every time you exhale, you want to feel your body getting heavier and heavier and heavier. So the process of this would be, you know, you close your eyes, you play the music, and you start with the slow paced deep abdominal breathing. Okay, so begin, take that nice deep cleansing breath in, and exhale out. And you're just going to take a nice breath all the way down, expanding the lower abdomen before you exhale out. And you're going to do that through the whole process. Okay, you would be playing music. And then after two, three, four breaths, you take a nice deep cleansing breath in. And as you exhale out, you re relax your forehead. Take a few, three, four more breaths, nice long deep breaths in and out. Then you take a nice deep cleansing breath in. And as you exhale out, you relax your cheeks and your jaw. Okay? And you continue to do that until you're all the way down to your toes. You would Continue breathing nice and slow. And the whole idea is emphasis on the exhale. Every time you exhale, you want to feel your body getting heavier and heavier. You might feel her getting heavier and heavier on you. And that's, that's, that's the whole point. Okay? You could do this lying down on, you know, in bed or in this position. But you would go from your forehead down to your feet. Putting emphasis on the neck and the shoulders. Really dropping them down chest area, abdominal area, and it's normal that when you, you get to the belly part that the baby kicks or rolls because you've now relaxed a little bit. And then you go to the vertebrae, one at a time, all the way down through the back. And then you go hips, thighs, thighs, calves, and then the last one would be your feet. The last exhale, all that tension goes out through your feet. And it, to do it properly, you need about a good 10 minutes, but um, Really at that point, number one, if you don't go to sleep, you'll feel like you've had a good rest. Or number two, a lot of women that I've had in class that say they've tried this technique and that night they really slept well. Uh -huh. Contractions that are four minutes apart, lasting one minute each for one hour or longer, that's a good time to head to the hospital. We suggest whether you deliver at our hospital or someplace else, always take the tour so you know where you have to be before you have to be there. It does alleviate the fears, okay? So you head to the hospital, you come into Pomona Valley, you're going to park right in front of that semicircle where the big fountain is, leave everything in your car, lock the doors, come in, and the guard will have you walk down the hallway to elevator E, go upstairs to maternity. Partners, once she's in the observation unit, that's your turn to go back down and park the car in a regular parking spot. But leave everything in the car because you don't know if she's going to stay or go home. She's coming in for the assessment and they want you at least three centimeters to stay. 
or if your water's broken. Okay? If there's anything else going on, if there's high blood pressure or anything else, obviously you're going to stay. But if you're doing fine, the baby's fine, you're not at least three centimeters, they may send you home, say go home, do some things for a couple hours, and then come back, we'll do an assessment again. You don't want to bring in your birth ball, your 18 suitcases, and bring them upstairs, and they say, nope, she's going home. <sighs> then you've got to carry everything back down to the car. Okay. So you get off the elevator, there's a waiting room, there's a nurse's desk, say, my name is so-and-so, my doctor so-and-so, I'm in labor, and then partners, they'll take her back. When you're in the observation room, Mom, they'll have you remove your, your underclothing, your garments, and they're going to have you put on a gown, which looks like this. And this is actually one of the prettier ones. <laughs> but they have you put on a gown, okay? They're going to give you booties for your feet. They're so beautiful. Look at these lovely booties. But they'll give you those. And everywhere you sit, in the process of the assessment or labor, they're going to have these, and they call these chucks, okay? They're plastic on one side, cotton on the other. They protect you and the environment for, from, you know, because you're going to have some fluid leakage and things like that. So everywhere you sit, they'll be on your bed. If you want to sit on a chair, that type of thing, they're going to have that there. And like I said, it's normal to see streaks of blood on here. That's the bloody show we were talking about. We want to see that increase a little at a time because that tells us you're continuing to dilate, okay? So they'll have that there. Now, at some point, they're going to use uh, an external fetal monitor. And some of you may have already been on one. Some of you may have not been on one. But this times your contractions, and it, and it tells us how the baby is responding to your contractions. Two wide elastic bands. The one over the top of the uterus measures your contractions. The one underneath measures the baby's heart rate. Spits out a sheet of paper over here that gives the exact same information, and then two sets of numbers. Tip, typical baby's heart rate is 120 to 160. Your baby will have, you know, a medium somewhere along the way. You'll know what that is. And it will show up on here. And then the other set is your contractions as well. This is what the paper looks like. Baby's heart rate up above. And then the waves down here are your contractions. Every solid line on this piece of paper is one minute. So the nurse can look at that piece of paper and maybe determine, okay, your contractions are three to four minutes apart, lasting 60 seconds each, okay, and then tell what's going on with the baby's heart rate. At some point, they're going to do an internal exam to check for dilation, okay, and that will determine if you're staying or going home. In the bathroom, this will be in the potty. You're going to urinate right into there because that measures your ins and outs, okay? They want to make sure everything's working properly. You urinate right in here. You tell the nurse you've gone. She'll check, and then she'll put it in your chart. She can dump it. You leave it alone, okay? So don't worry about that. So it may take an hour to an hour and a half for the assessment, depending on how you are doing or where you are in your labor. So partners, you can wait in that waiting room. You can go down and get something to eat. At some point, they'll call the waiting room. And whoever's in there can answer the phone, and they'll say, can I speak to Miss so-and-so or Mr. so-and-so? And then that'll determine if she's going to stay or go home. Okay? If you stay, they'll get you admitted into the room, and they'll get you all set up. They'll get your nurse to come in. She'll do an assessment. She's going to ask you a lot of questions. And then from that point, you guys are on your own. You're going to do the things we're going to learn about in a little bit and change positions, do these things, offer her her chapstick and her, chap, her, her ice chips and all those things. If at any point you need the nurse, in the bed rails, there's buttons there you can push for help. She'll come in about every hour, take your blood pressure, take your temperature. Now, one of the things your, your caregiver will test for when you hit about 35 weeks is called GBS. It's called group beta strep. It's a virus that you can carry that the baby can pick up during the process of labor and birth. If that is positive, they're going to give you antibiotics during your labor. So they'll start an IV right away. Some women carry it, some do not. And then maybe this pregnancy, you test positive, you get pregnant again. Um, some caregivers won't even test again. They'll just assume you still have it, and they'll just give you antibiotics again. Okay? But it, you're not ill, but your body can carry it. So they have to be really careful. Okay? So if you come into the hospital well hydrated, you may not need an IV. They may just put in a HEPLOC, cap it off. It's done. And then later, if you decide you want medication or you need medication, it's already taken care of, okay? So if you're GBS positive or if you're not, uh, if you're not hydrated, they're going to start an IV right away. If not, they'll just put the HEP lock on, it's done, and then if it's there, or if it's there, they need it later, it's already taken care of, okay? And then you settle in, 
nurse comes in, she'll, she'll take care of you anytime you need any help. Transition. This is transition here. Like I said, intense part of labor, but thank goodness it's the fastest part. The good thing about labor is as you start to get into it farther and farther, the time frames speed up. It gets faster, um, but at this point, very intense, like I mentioned earlier, because the contractions feel like they're back to back to back. She's dilating from 7 to 10 centimeters. Contractions can be uh, 60 to 90 seconds each or more and one to three minutes apart. So you have a really long contraction and a little teeny break. And that's for some women is the intense part because she's breathing, breathing, breathing. She's got this long contraction. Contraction starts to come down. She thinks she has a break and all of a sudden, boom, and another one starts. Okay. So partners, you need to remind her how close she is. You were this close to having a baby. You are almost done, especially if she's one of those women that is motivated not to take medication. She needs to be reminded you are this close. And, though, and some women, when they get to this point, it can be 10, 15 minutes, you can be done. Okay, but she needs to be reminded of that. So she can become intense, restless, overwhelmed. You ask her what she wants, she doesn't know. She says, get me my socks, I don't want the socks, I hate you, I love you, go away, come here. She has no clue. It's normal for them to cry, they don't even know why they're crying. Okay, in fact, some of the guys sometimes when I have them do the pelvic tilt, they ask me, why do you make us do the pelvic tilt? Because I say, you need to be comfortable, comfortable doing things with her in a semi-public place you've never done in your life. Okay? She can be on the bed naked. You can be holding her. She could be crying. You could be crying. And the door is opening and closing. You've got people coming in and out of your room. You need to be comfortable with this. And this may be the time when that comes up. Okay? So she may fall asleep. You're thinking, how can she fall asleep? Doesn't she realize she's about to have a baby? But they're tired. The funny part is sometimes they fall asleep in the middle of a sentence. She's sitting on the bed going, oh, yeah, and she just starts snoring. And the partner's going, yes, I got a break. <laughs> How long do you think that break's going to be? <laughs> Not much. <laughs> Very short. Okay. Now, it's okay for her to sleep, but you need to watch the monitor because when it begins to tick, you need to wake her up because what happens is if you don't, she'll sleep at the beginning of the contraction and then wake up at the peak the strongest point and she's not going to be able to deal with it. Okay, so you watch her, she sleeps, contraction begins to tick on the monitor, tap her hand or rub her and usually they just start to breathe with it. Okay, now shaking, trembling, vomiting, gas, hiccuping can start in active phase and go through transition. It's all normal, it's all physiologic, but if you're experiencing it, it doesn't feel right. Okay, but it's a part of labor. You get the chills, or da, 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 your jaw chatters, da, 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 are you cold, da, 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 I don't know. Or you get the hiccups that come from the feet, Rawr. the whole body hiccups. Or maybe she's lying down in bed and you go to help her breathe and she burps in your face. <laughs> or whoop, it can come out that end, you're thinking, am I going to explode? <laughs> now vomiting, maybe, maybe not. Two reasons, hormonal change and a response to pain. Okay. So partners, my suggestion to you, if she starts to feel nauseous, ask the nurse for one of those pink buckets and a washcloth and kind of tuck it to the side because her getting from the bed or the chair into the bathroom will not happen, okay? So if she needs to, you have it right there. And usually by that point, they don't have much because it's stomach bile or maybe um, ice chips or whatever. But she'll probably feel a little bit better. And then um, number two, if there's any positive to vomit at all, it helps you to dilate, okay? So... Um, if you do start to throw up, the nurse may not stop it right away because it does help with labor, but if you are uncomfortable, they can give you medication. So it may or may not happen. It's just one of those things. It's a possibility. One of the biggest issues with transition is the possible urge to push. Now, when I was showing you those, those uh, anatomy charts, I kept referring to the vagina and the rectum, okay, back to back. As that baby's head comes down through the vagina, it puts pressure on the rectum, okay? It's a normal feeling. It's a part of labor. As you come closer to complete dilation, to feel like you have to have a bowel movement, okay? Um, so if she's sitting there, she's on bed, and she's breathing, oh, boy, I got to go. I got to poop. It's not poop. It's a baby, okay? 
So if she says that, you ask her a question. Do you feel it just during the contraction or in between? If she says just during, she's fine. Okay, she's handling it. She's breathing. The issue comes when some women begin to push and they're not fully dilated. And the problem with that is if she continues to push and she's not dilated, her cervix can tear or it can swell. If it tears, they have to stitch it up. If it swells, sometimes it'll go back too far. She may end up having a cesarean. So your number one job is to keep her from pushing. So this urge is so strong, partners, you may not recognize it, but I'll show you what it'll look like if she begins to push, okay? She's sitting in bed, and she's breathing, and she's... <laughs> she's pushing, or... <laughs> she's pushing, and you need to get her to stop. And the way you do that is by candle blowing. Candle blowing is like you're trying to blow out a candle that's on the other side of the room. You get right up to her. You take her hand. You look at her right here. She may turn her head. Uh-uh. Look at me. Breathe with me. Just like that. Like she's trying to blow out a candle. Because when you're candle blowing, it takes all the pressure off. You can't push unless you stop and hold your breath. And they try to sneak them in. Okay? So it's... Uh-uh. Breathe. Good. Uh, 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 breathe. That contraction ends, you call the nurse. You tell her she has rectal pressure, she wants to push. You keep candle blowing with her till the nurse comes in. Now, if the nurse checks and she's 10 centimeters, it's not a problem. The problem comes if she's eight or nine. She's going to do that for several more contractions. So you need to tell her it's up to you. You can have this baby now or you can have it later. Breathe that cervix away, and you can have this baby. She needs to know how much power she has at that point because it's a very intense feeling. Partners, hopefully you've never been in this situation. You're at work somewhere. You have a really bad case of diarrhea, and you're running to the bathroom. And you get there, and it says, out of order. <laughs> what do you mean I can't go? It's like, what do you mean I can't push? <laughs> I really want to do it. So that candle blowing is a very important tool to keep her from doing that. Now the nurse, she does that exam. She may hang around in the room because she knows it's going to be a few more minutes. She's going to check again, and you may be fully dilated. But we don't want you pushing until we know that you are 10 centimeters. So you stay calm. You stay by her side. Never leave her alone. Remind her the baby's almost here. Have her candle blowing. Have that check. And you're one step closer to being finished. You are so close at that point. Give her a lot of praise and encouragement. Partners, I can't stress that enough. No matter what she's doing, she's going to feel like it's not much at all. So you need to give her a lot of praise. You're doing a wonderful job. The baby's almost here. I love you. Give her a kiss on the cheek, hug her, that type of thing. Okay, if she allows you to touch her. <laughs> if not, praise her from behind. No, <laughs> just back up a little bit. But she needs to hear that. And I know, partners, for you, you're going to feel like everything you're doing is not enough either. But it is, okay? So, one step at a time. Second stage. How far do we have to dilate to give birth to our baby? 10 centimeters. So, second stage begins with the complete dilation of the cervix. It's 10 centimeters and ends with the birth of your baby. Typically 30 minutes to an hour and a half to two hours. We really don't want you pushing longer than two hours because then you're going to be tired and it's going to be difficult for you. Okay? So we call this the participation phase because before your job was to sit back, relax, and breathe. But now you get to actively do something to birth your baby. And for a lot of women, it's a relief to push. You get to do something with that discomfort. Okay? So a couple different scenarios. If you were candle blowing to prevent pushing. That usually indicates the baby's pretty low. Usually you get to 10 centimeters. As soon as that doctor walks in the room, boom, 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 baby's out. Very little pushing you have to do. But a lot of women get to 10 centimeters and their contractions fade away. We nickname this phase the, the rest and be thankful stage. Sit back and relax and be thankful you got a break. Okay? Because they're setting up your room. They're preparing for the birth. The warming unit's turned on. They bring in a big table with a blue drape on it. There's a bassinet outside the door. They're doing all these things, and your job is sit back and to relax. And this is your time, partners, to talk about second stage pushing with her if you have this lull. 
going to try to instruct you on how to avoid pushing too long. So the number one rule is you get to 10 centimeters. If you don't have the urge to push, don't do it. If the nurse suggests, hey, you're 10 centimeters, let's try this. If you don't have that rectal pressure, pressure feeling, just tell her, I don't have the urge. I prefer to wait. Because what happens, if you start pushing too soon, you'll push longer than if you wait for your body to go through natural changes. Okay? So you sit back, relax. Partners, that's your time. Get a, a fresh, cool washcloth, some chapstick, ice chips, boom, 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 and you guys review pushing. Okay? So the number one rule is if you don't have the urge, don't do it. Okay? Now the bed itself breaks down a couple different ways. Pretend I'm on the bed this way. Number one way is the bottom half of the bed comes off. They put it in the corner. There's foot pedals, pedals that come up. There's a basin down below. They'll have you sit on the edge with your rear end to the edge of the bed, and then your feet will be in the foot pedals, and they'll put a plastic bag underneath your rear end. Some caregivers don't take the bottom half of the bed off. They just lower it down and then still put that plastic bag underneath your rear end. So it just depends on your doctor how they set up the room. Okay, so the nurse will wait until the doctor comes in. All right. Now, contractions start to come back. You want to push when the urge is at the strongest. Like you've been constipated for two weeks and they tell you you can go now, you really want to do it. What will happen is you'll work less, your body will work better for you, and we'll get that baby out sooner. <sighs> now, if you have had an epidural for pushing, they're going to put stirrups on the bed. I call them leg supports. If that's the case, your legs will be up here and they'll shake a little bit, okay? If you haven't had an epidural, what you're going to do when the time comes to push, moms, you're going to put your hands behind your knees and you're going to pull them up towards your earlobes and your, your chin is going to be on your chest. You want your head down, that way you curl up around the baby, okay? So legs come up, curl up around the baby and be just like this, head down and you push. If you have had the epidural, your legs will be up here, okay? When the time comes to push, partner might be holding one leg, sister, uncle, nurse holding the other leg. If that's the case, partners, there's handles right here. Make sure she grips those for leverage to pull herself up. Because if she doesn't have these, I've seen women panic, where they, ooh, they just start grabbing, and it can be hair, crotch, whatever's right there, she's going to pull for leverage, okay? So... Basic semi-sitting positions. Sometimes they'll have you on your side, and if that's the case, they'll have you this way. You have a couple pillows under your head, and then you'll pull your own leg up behind this way, curl up around the baby, and push. Partners, when her foot is in the air, that's when you'll support it. One hand on each side or against your shoulder blade, but hold it firmly, because if she slips, boom, face, gut, or lower, depending on how tall you are. Okay? Now, there may be a point when you're pushing that they may need you to squat. And this is another reason why we want to do squats. So, when you're in the squatting position, the pelvis is open one to two centimeters larger. Okay? Now, we talked about those pelvic stations. If the baby is still minus, this is where the squatting may come in. They may bring in a squatting bar and attach it to the bed, or they may have you squat at the side of the bed, or they may have you sit on the toilet for a while. Once the baby moves down, then they'll get you in a re regular pushing position to finish off the pushing, okay? So partners, you'll be on one side of the bed or the other, all right? Now, second rule, rule number two, when the time comes to push, I want you to take two quick cleansing breaths and you hold the third, so it'd be And then you push. By taking those two quick cleansing breaths, what happens is it keeps oxygen in your lungs and it helps you to expel the baby. So again, your body's working better for you and you're doing less work all around. Okay, so take the time to take the two breaths, hold the third, and you push. And while you're pushing, your partner is counting to 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Now, it's important when you say, when you get to 10, you tell her exhale or blow it out. So it'll be 10, inhale, push, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Exhale, inhale, 
push and we because we don't want you to lose your momentum okay now again listen to your body you have that rectal urge you push while you have the rectal urge you may have the urge five times it might be three it might be two typically they want you to push three times during a contraction okay now as you're pushing nurse right here she can be doing perineal massage she puts two fingers in that vaginal opening and she does this they put a little oil there it helps stretch the perineum okay now you're pushing babies moving down you may feel like it's going nowhere for a woman that's pushing it feels like it's just there so sometimes a nurse gives you a little bit of encouragement oh look you want to see the hair look come you dad you want to see the hair look at the hair and the reason why she's telling you that is that tells mom that the baby's moving down okay now eventually a little top of the baby's head is exposed and then it retracts a little bit and then a little bit and then it retracts a little bit well eventually it doesn't retract okay eventually about that much of the baby's head stays exposed that's considered crowning okay now with the next push they will determine if you need to have an episiotomy or not an episiotomy is a cut made in the vaginal opening either straight down towards the rectum or one side or the other to make that opening larger okay but research has proven most women can give birth without one but as they're doing that perineal massage and you begin to push if that area turns white and glossy they know it's not going to stretch anymore they're going to have to make a cut they want to avoid it but sometimes we just can't okay so partners if you see a couple things coming over to that area of the body they're going to make an incision okay uh, uh, it, scissors and a large syringe so you can look the other way like oh nice lights whatever it is um, because again up until this point there's still a lot of fluid not that much blood okay so she continues to push now when the widest circumference of the baby's head comes through you'll experience for maybe a few seconds 20 seconds or so what we nicknamed the rim of fire that's the burning sensation until the skin pulls back okay now skin pulls back and now, if the baby has had a bowel movement, there will be meconium in the water, that green tinge we talked about earlier. This is where you have to stop pushing because they want to take a, a few seconds to sec suction out the baby's nose and throat. If there is meconium in there with the next push, there's an opportunity for it to come down into the lungs and cause a really bad infection. So if you need to, again, candle blow while they do that. They also check for a cord. Many times if there is one, they can just pull it right over. If it's too tight, they may opt to cut it at that point. Okay. Now, the next push, top shoulder comes through, bottom shoulder comes through. It's real slippery after the shoulders. It's like blah, 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 real slippery. It's like, Ooh, everyone gets all excited. And then they put the baby on your chest like this. Now, they're going to make sure it doesn't catch a chill. They'll dry it up. And, you know, sometimes you're, you're excited or the home room just kind of goes silent. So it's like, whoa like what did we just do or it's like even though you know it's a boy it's a boy oh you're so beautiful you know so they dry the baby up they're going to clamp the cord and they're going to offer partner to cut the cord between the clamps if you don't want to do it that's fine if you they'll do it if you want to that's perfectly fine too so you cut in between there and then they'll give you a little bit of time with the baby and then eventually they'll take the baby over to the warming unit where they'll perform all the procedures on the baby okay now while they're performing the procedures on the baby they finish up with mom one of the things they will be doing with your baby is called the apgar score okay they do it one minute after birth and five minutes after birth it checks the wellness of your baby and they're going to look for some very specific things they want the baby actively crying they want the heart rate above 100 beats per minute your baby's body will be perfect you know mostly pink but sometimes the hands and feet stay blue because the blood vessels are very tiny so it takes a while for the circulation to get to those parts um, your baby's been curled up so they wanted to stay curled up immediately after birth now under that warming unit nice warming unit within about 20 minutes or so they're like like they're at the beach but eventually you know when they're first born we want them to curl back up again okay they're going to do a gag reflex test they're going to put a tube down your baby's throat to check it for gag response and we want that we want them to ga gag cough sneeze so if you <laughs> those are good noises okay now, a perfect score is a 10. Very few babies will get a 10. But the first test is one minute after birth, and the second one is five minutes after birth. So the first one is equal or lower than the second one. So they might say the APGAR score was 99, 89, 78. This is what they're referring to. Okay. 
Another thing that we'll be doing, they're obviously going to weigh it. They're going to measure it. They can give you a copy of the footprinting for your baby book. They're going to put an antibiotic ointment in its eyes to, to protect it from sexually transmitted diseases. So when the, they give the baby back, it looks like a little Vaseline. They're like, OK. And they're also going to give it a vitamin K injection. Vitamin K depletes towards the end of a pregnancy. And that's a blood clotting protein that builds up in a baby's bowels once they have eaten. This baby hasn't eaten, it can hemorrhage. So they give them the vitamin K so their blood will clot. And um, they give them the Hep B vaccine. OK, so while they're doing all this with the baby, they're going fi to be finishing up with you. So the next thing they're waiting for, they're waiting for this placenta to detach. And usually within you know, anywhere from 5 to 30 minutes, it begins to detach. In the process of that, if there has been a cut made or any tears or lacerations, they're going to check. They're going to begin to stitch those up and clean you up. Okay. Now, by this point, partner is bouncing back and forth between mom and baby. Okay. Now, partners, if you're standing over by the baby and you look over at her and you see a gush of blood, number one, it's supposed to happen. And number two, it's more fluid than blood because the placenta is detaching. So they put a blue bucket here. They know because the, the, the cord begins to lengthen out and the blood loss increases. So they'll have you push a little bit, nowhere like pushing a baby out, just like a little, and it's like a blue, okay? They're going to check it out. You don't have to look at it, but it is actually very cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they're going to they're gonna look at it really quick. They're going to flip it over, look at it, because they're looking for some very specific things. They want to make sure it's a bright reddish purple. They want to make sure that there's no calcifications, and they need to make sure that no, no fragments have been retained. Okay. If they have been retained, there's a possibility of infection and also your, your breast milk from not fully coming in. Because it's actually giving birth to this that sends a signal to your brain that says, OK, we need to produce milk now. And then put the baby on the breast, and it gets that process started. OK. So that's taken care of. And then the next thing you will absolutely hate if you haven't had an epidural, it's your tummy's very tender. They're going to make a fist, and they're going to go at the top of the uterus, which is called the fundus, and they're going to massage because they want to control the bleeding. OK. And it, it's, it's sore. So they'll do that a couple times. They'll check the bleeding. If necessary, they'll give you medication to slow that down. Um, they will put Pitocin in your IV once you give birth to make those blood vessels constrict to control bleeding. Okay. So they'll do all that. They'll clean you up, bring the baby back over to you, and then that's your time. They're going to get people out of your room. You have that two hours of bonding time to take the blanket off and look at the fingers and the toes, and it's got your nose and my eyes. And, you know, all that fun stuff. And then put them on the breast. Put them skin to skin with you because research has proven. You put the baby skin to skin with mom, they latch sooner, they latch better, their heart rate comes down. It's a whole other aspect of it. So you have that time to bond with your baby. Okay? So when it comes to pushing, number one rule is if you don't have the urge, don't do it. Number two is once the urge comes back, you take the two cleansing breaths, blow them out, hold the third, and that's when you push, your partner counts to 10, you tell her exhale, inhale, push again, and then you go through the process until that contraction has ended. And then when it, once it ends, you, t you have to take a couple nice deep cleansing breaths to bring a lot of good oxygen down to your baby. Okay? So this is what it may look like when the time comes. <sighs> Contraction's over, put your legs down. Partners, if she's had the epidural, you put her legs back in there. Sit back, ice chips, mm, washcloth. OK, take a break. You have like three to five minutes in between the contractions at this point. OK, here it comes again. All right, let's go for it. And that's when the cheerleading starts. You know, the doctor's there. They're going to give you instruction. They may say, give me little pushes, pant blow, that type of thing. But when that baby's head's coming down, they don't want you to lose momentum. And they'd say, push, push, go, go. Sometimes they'll do that. And you think, 
there's no way I have energy left, and it comes from unbelievable places. And so that baby's head comes through, okay? Medications and labor. Okay, I always suggest to the students in my class, don't decide today, don't decide next week about taking medications and labor. Wait until you are in labor because everyone labors differently. And you usually have two groups of women. The one group that says, I cannot stand pain. When I get in there, I want my epidural. She may be the group of women that can go through labor and birth and not need anything at all. Or the other group of women that says, you know, I've done my research, I know it's better for me, better for my baby not to take drugs in labor. And then she kind of hits a typical scenario, okay? Most of us go to bed 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, sleep really good for a couple hours. Then what happens after a couple hours? You have to get up and pee. So you get up, you go to the bathroom, you come back to bed, and you toss and turn and toss and turn. You've got the 18 pillows, and you're trying to get comfortable, and you can't. So you give up and say, okay, forget it. Well, maybe I'll watch some TV. So you start flipping through the channels, and you go through 10, 12 times, hoping that the next time around there will be something worth watching, and there is not. So then you say, oh, maybe I need a snack. I'll go in the kitchen, have a glass of, uh, a glass of milk, a bowl of cereal, something, and then go back to bed and then toss and turn and toss and turn. Well, for most women, when labor begins, it starts off very slowly, very mild, and you kind of work your way into it. And you probably could sleep through it, but the problem is your adrenaline is high. So you go back to bed, and you're sitting there. I don't know, should I wake him up? Oh, I don't know. And you're so excited that you can't sleep. OK, so labor progresses. Now. You've gone through early, and you're getting into active, where I always say she's really cooking with gas, and there's no turning back. She's now been up for 12, 14 hours. What happens to your pain threshold when you're tired? Everything is worse when you're tired. So that woman that was staying nice and relaxed is now tensing up, increasing her pain, and making it difficult. She may benefit from having a narcotic to give her a little bit of a break. And she has the option to change her mind, because that's what it's about. It's about having options. These things are there whether you want them or you feel you need them. But she changes her mind, but she get, begins to feel guilty like she's done something wrong. And that's not what it's about. It's about having the best labor and birth experience you can have every time. And if it means having a narcotic, so be it. If it means having an epidural, so be it. No one walks out of the hospital wearing a blue ribbon that says, I did have an epidural or I didn't. Okay? So I always encourage you, wait until you get into labor about making those decisions. And you, mom, are the only one that can make that decision. No one else in the room can make it for you. So when it comes to medications, we have a couple choices. We have narcotics and the epidural. They both work well. They both will change your labor and birth situation. It will affect you, your labor, and your baby in some way. Positive, negative, we don't really know until we get in there. But starting off with narcotics. Now with the narcotics, um, they won't fully take the contraction away but it'll take the edge off, it'll take the intensity off. They will help you to relax, calm down, get a little bit of a rest. And for some women, I know a couple hours doesn't sound like a lot, but if you've been up for a while, that two hour break is a really nice break. They reassess, they check again. Sometimes you're over the hump, where I say where you're ready to push, you're ready to give birth. Some women dilate very quickly, some do not. So, they help you to relax, calms down, help you get some sleep. And sometimes, because you now have relaxed, you dilate faster. Okay. The biggest issue with the narcotics is they are systemic. They do cross the placenta. So while it's in your system, the baby will, having, will be having that medication as well. So uh, the perfect window is four to eight centimeters. It is better if you wait to five or six, but you don't have to. They will give it to you if you want it at four. But also with the narcotics, as you need to realize is, the closer you get to full dilation, they just don't give you as much coverage. So the first shot always works better than the rest. And if you are late in labor, if you're coming on to eight or nine centimeters and you haven't had medication at all, and you ask the nurse, I need something for pain, give me some drugs, she may tell you no. And don't get upset. She's trying to protect you and your baby. Because if that medication is given too late in labor, then the process that happens with your baby is it can have respiratory depression when it's born. So they want to avoid that. So if the nurse tells you no, she's trying to protect both of you. Okay. 
So with the narcotics, the nice thing is they're temporary. Once you have meta metabolized it, it's gone. If you wish to, you can get up and use the bathroom. Um, but the whole idea is to take a break. So I encourage you, go to the bathroom first, get in bed, get comfortable. And they put it into your IV. And within a few minutes, you start to feel relaxation set in. Some women get goofy, they drool, they giggle. Some verbalize these little dreams that they have. And partners, you may not have an idea what she's talking about. It's the medication talking. Some will just kind of sit there, and they'll just they'll be nice and comfortable. And they'll kind of breathe through it. And then they'll sleep a little bit. And or some will just wake up and breathe and then go right back out again. So if you decide that's where you want to start, start with that. And then if it doesn't give you the coverage you need, you can still have an epidural. When it comes to the epidural, um, some things to remember. Um, if you want to be moving around, if you want to ambulate, you won't be able to do that any longer with the epidural. You will be in bed for the remainder of your labor and birth. Okay, so if the narcotic no longer works for you, you can still have an epidural because they do work differently. This shows uh, the spinal and the epidural. The epidural is given for labor. Okay, what they'll do is they'll clean this area three times with betadine, and they'll uh, insert the needle two inches between the vertebrae into the dural space here. They will numb the area prior to inserting the needle. So if you've ever had that type of medication, it burns a little bit. So they may use the terminology, here comes the bee sting, um, to warn you ahead of time. They numb the area, and then they insert the needle into that dural space. The way this medication works, it doesn't cross the placenta the way the narcotics do, but it numbs the pathway that goes up to mom's brain so her brain doesn't get the signal that she's in discomfort. Okay, again, the perfect time frame is 4 centimeters to 8 centimeters. Um, now, partners, if she decides she wants an epidural, when the anesthesiologist comes in, be prepared. They may ask you to do a couple different things. They may ask you to step out and leave the room. They may ask you to sit in the corner, or they may ask you to actively participate in supporting her in this process. If they ask you to step out, don't take it personally. They're trying to protect both of you. Okay. So the nurse, once she finds out you want the epidural, she will call the anesthesiologist and find out where they're at, find out how long it'll be. If they're down the hall, it may take a few minutes. But if they're in surgery, it may be longer than that. Okay. So when the, the biggest thing she needs to make sure is you have plenty of fluids in your system. Because when epidurals are in place, there's a reduced oxygen supply and blood supply to the placenta, which in turn can cause fetal distress. If there is not enough fluids in mom's system, her blood pressure can drop, and then you see this, this progression happening. So the, she'll need, need to make sure you're well hydrated. And then what will happen is when the anesthesiologist comes in, They'll have mom scoot into the center of the bed. And sometimes this is the hardest part. She scoots all the way to the center. They'll put a stool underneath her feet. Okay, level out feet. Sometimes they'll have her hug a pillow or lean on the nurse. And then they'll feel between the vertebrae to find the place they want to work. Now, once they find that place, watch what I do with my lower back. They'll have you arch it out back farther to the anesthesiologist to give them more room to work. So once that area is found, that's when they will numb the area and start that process. This process is more mental than physical. Thinking about, oh my gosh, they're putting a needle in my back can be a little bit scary. But past that burning sensation of the local, from that point you would feel a lot of pressure, which sometimes in itself can be a little bit weird. But um, as long as you focus on your relaxation and breathing, you need to stay as still as possible. That's where we want um, your focus to be while they're doing this. So this is the needle that is used with an epidural. They'll put this in place. And then what they'll do is they'll thread this catheter through the needle. This catheter stays in place, and the needle comes out. This is what stays in your lower back, very stretchy. Okay, So they'll put this in. And they'll tape your back all up. So if you have a hairy back, you're going to have a wax job when they're done. But they tape it all back, all, all over, so because they, they don't want it to slip out. Because this is what feeds the medication into that area. And it's put through a pump. They can regulate it through the pump. OK. So they'll give you a test dose. Make sure it's all working effectively. They'll lie you down, put a little wedge underneath your rear end, and have you lie down for a little bit, because it works with gravity. 
Once they know you have good coverage, and typical coverage is from here to here, then they'll semi-set you up. And this is why they don't want you. Um, so this is why they don't want that catheter to slip out, because the nurse will prop you, put pillows all around here. She'll put a pillow here, because this leg will just, it's like dead weight. Boom, boom, boom. Lay on that side for a little while, maybe an hour, hour and a half. And then she'll come in, and she's going to rotate you to the center or to the opposite side and do the same thing. And the reason why they want to do this is they want the baby to continue to rotate down. They don't want you to keep you in one spot because that will slow things down. Okay? So she's going to be moving you from one position to the other. Now, partners, it's very important you don't move her on your own. You get a little woman on an epidural, she feels like she weighs 500 pounds because it is dead weight. So if she needs to move, you call the nurse, you two move her together. We need to protect you and her from hurting her lower back or hurting yourself, okay? So along with epidurals is the issue is it's long term. Once you have the epidural in place, you will not be getting out of bed. And um, they will be putting a catheter into your bladder. They will uh, have to do some other maneuvers. Now, some doctors prefer an internal fetal monitor that's used with an epidural. I showed you the external fetal monitor earlier. This is the internal fetal monitor, and it has a little electrode on the tip, and that goes into the baby's thin area of the baby's scalp. This gives them a better reading. They need to watch your baby very closely, because again, if the blood pressure drops too low, it can cause fetal distress. Other reasons why they may use this, if maybe there has been signs of fetal distress, maybe there has been meconium in the water, maybe um, some babies are so active externally they can't get them on an external fetal monitor, they may have to use an internal fetal monitor. This is what it looks like. This is the area that's inserted into the top thin area of the baby's scalp. And where it's been placed, there might be a little scab or some bruising, but long term, um, if there's been scar tissue there, hair does not grow over scar tissue. So I'm sure you may have seen some people have a little tiny bald spot here or here. That's usually where one of these have been placed. Okay, but they do get a better reading. So some will prefer to use the internal fetal monitor when an epidural has been in place. If your water hasn't broken, they will need to break it to insert the internal fetal monitor. So they use the amni hook into the cervical area. They nick the membrane. There's no nerve endings in the membrane. It'll feel like an internal exam. Okay, but that water is released. A couple things happen if your water breaks or they break it for you. Prostaglandins are released that are natural labor enhancers. So it's normal to have an increase in your contractions. And also, there's no longer that cushion of water between the baby's head and the pelvic floor. So the baby's head starts coming down a little bit more intensely. So it's normal to feel that response. But with an epidural in place, you won't feel that response. Okay. But they'll need to do this to insert that monitor. Now, again, possibilities, not absolutes. Um, blood pressure dropping. Um, some women will run a temperature with an epidural. Uh, sometimes the epidural is so dense that a woman can't move her legs or wiggle her toes. So I always suggest if you're in bed and you're lying there and you can't feel anything and someone says, okay, wiggle your toes and you're like, wiggle your, I'm trying. <laughs> If they don't wiggle, if you can't wiggle your toes or move your legs, then it's going to make pushing a little bit more difficult. The perfect epidural is one where you're blocked by pain, but you have pressure or a hug sensation with your contractions. If you have that stimulation, you're going to be able to feel to push. But if there's nothing there, then what I would suggest, when you get to 10 centimeters, you ask the nurse to turn it off. It'll take a while for it to fully leave your body. We don't wait for it to fully leave your body. As soon as you start to feel some stimulation or some pressure, that's when you want to begin to push. When you are pushing and giving birth to your baby, the baby doesn't come straight down. It makes these cardinal movements. So when you're pushing, your abdominals are rotating this baby. And when an epidural is in place, if you don't have any stimulation, it makes pushing really difficult. So you want to help your body with this process of these cardinal movements, bringing this baby down to help rotate and push your baby through. So again, if you have no feeling, have them turn it off, wait till that pressure comes back, and then you can push with that pressure. Really makes a big difference. In the process, with an epidural, 
uh, when you begin to push, that's when they will remove the catheter, they will trim the end of the internal fetal monitor, and then they'll watch the pushing process. And so by the time you're finished, then all those things will be taken care of. When the epidural is in place, we find a couple things happen. All of a sudden, partners think they're not needed. She's comfortable, she's happy. Oh, let's go have something to eat. So they take off. Don't go very far because just like with the narcotics, some women will dilate quicker on an epidural. They were tired, they were tensing up, now they've relaxed and oh, everything starts to happen. So partners, if she takes a nap, that's fine. But if she wakes up, she needs to have someone there for her emotional support. So if you have family members there, they stay, you go eat, you come back, they can go. That way someone's in the room with her the whole time. If she needs that emotional support, you'll be there. And also, too, if she be begins to dilate pretty quickly, then you'll be there for the event. They're not going to get on the phone and say, Mr. So-and-so, come back, she's pushing. Okay? So we need someone in the room with her. I've seen it happen a lot where a woman will begin to dilate and then faster than they anticipated, and then we need to bring everybody back. Okay? With an epidural in place, sometimes if there is difficulty pushing, mom can come become exhausted, it makes it difficult to push your baby out. If the baby's large, if the heart rate drops, that will be an instant where they may choose to bring in the vacuum extractor. Okay, and the vacuum extractor is attached to that area of the baby's head that's coming through. They put that on there, and then as mom is pushing, someone on the other end is pumping to help bring the baby through. They will attach this to the top of the baby's head, and as mom is pushing, someone on the other end is helping to expel her baby and it will come through this way. If a vacuum extractor has been used, there will be a little area on the baby's scalp that will be a little bit more tender. It will be a little bit more um, bulb-like. Uh, when we push, this is the first part of the baby's head that comes through. Now, we dilate to 10 centimeters, but their baby's, their head is larger than that. Why does it fit? because of the skull plates. The, the fontanels here, the gaps between the skull plates, allow those skull plates to overlap each other as we push and bring our baby through. But because of that, the babies have molding, what a lot of people call a cone head. So their skulls are very soft. Usually by the end of the day or the next day, they're nice and round. If a vacuum extractor has been used, it will be more cup-like. And you may notice that it may take a little bit longer for that to go down, but it will go down. Coming up to different labor and birth experiences, some women labor very quickly, some do not. Some take hours to dilate one centimeter, some can go pretty fast. Um, in different labor situations, we have a precipitous labor, and that's a very fast labor, typically characterized in three hours and under. From start to finish, contraction, birth, you skipped A and B and gone to Z. Basically, what happens is you're starting labor in transition, that very last part of labor which can be very overwhelming um, because everything we've taught you in class goes out the window. The best thing partners you can do is support her through this process and keeping her focused and on task and relaxed as much as possible. Now she may feel a little bit left out. She may forget what has taken place during this process. So you fill in the puzzle pieces. Well, you said this or we did that or that type of thing. And I know it sounds silly. She feels like she's been cheated. And other people are like, man, you had a fast labor. What are you complaining about? But, you know, opposite sides of the, of the spectrum. So basically, you keep her focused and on task and help her to stay calm as much as possible. And then our team will be in there to help her get through it. Now, if you're on the way to the hospital and she says, the baby's coming, don't keep driving faster. Okay, pull over, call, call 911, get her supported until they arrive. Very basic stuff. Put something underneath her rear end, and if they're not there and the baby becomes, uh, uh, begins to be delivered, just support that baby's head, wipe any mucus out of the way, and then when the baby comes through, the best thing you can do is put that baby skin to skin, naked on her, cover both of them, put the baby on the breast. Don't worry about the placenta. They'll deal with everything else. But having the baby on the breast, skin to skin with mom, with mom will keep that baby nice and warm and putting the baby on the breast will hopefully control a little bit of bleeding.
when it comes to inductions, um, would be some reasons why they may need to induce. Um, first of all, if you're past your due date, um, uh, small for gestational age, maybe you're 38 weeks, the baby's measuring 35, it's going to be better off out than in. Um, gestational diabetes, a um, lot of different factors with induction. Preeclampsia, high blood pressure. These are reasons why they may want to induce. If you have an option, I would encourage you to wait and go into labor on your own. Because anytime an induction has taken place, typically it takes longer to give birth. So if you have the option, then I encourage you. Um, being tired of being pregnant is not a reason to induce. So really take the time, do what you can do. Now some natural things you can do at home, if you are just past your due date, one of the best things you can do is have sex. Because there's prostaglandins in semen. Semen acts on the cervix, sometimes it helps a woman to go into labor. Very basic stuff. You can talk to your caregiver about suggestions they may have. So, but if there comes down to a point where they need to induce, it can go a couple different ways. Okay, if you are dilated at all, if your cervix is effaced, this is a good situation for an induction. So they may bring you in that evening or that morning and start medication right away. Um, they put Pitocin into your IV and every woman reacts differently to this medication. Some women, it needs very little and it can get their contractions going. Some need a lot before they see benefits from this. So they put it into your IV, you get comfortable, and the nurse can increase this medication every 15 minutes, but they're going to try to get your labor pattern into a nice two to three minute mark. And once it's to that point, they can either stop the medication or bring it back and see if your body continues to labor on its own. If not, they will just keep it going. Um, if you have not dilated at all, if there has not been cervical change, then they may want to bring you in and start another medication called Cervidel. It looks like a little suppository on a kite string. They put it behind the cervical area, and that may take several hours for it to take effect. Sometimes it causes contractions on its own. Sometimes it will just soften the cervix. So they'll try this for many hours, and then if that seems to do the trick, then they'll start the Pitocin. But when it comes to inductions, it can be anywhere from a few hours to a couple days. So that's why you really need to know that if it's an option, I encourage you to wait and kind of do it on your own. If your body isn't ready to go into labor and they're trying to do this process, that a lot of inductions will end in cesareans because the body wasn't ready to go into labor on its own. So that's another reason why I encourage you to wait if you have the option. If it's a medical reason, that's totally different. cesarean birth. Um, this chart shows indications for cesarean sections and I'm going to start here and just kind of whip my way around and kind of give you an explanation. Uh, umbilical cord prolapse. Now this is an issue if the baby is up high or if the baby is breech. If mom's water breaks with a gush, partners, you need to believe her if she says, I feel something. So if she feels something in the vaginal area, you have her get in this position and bring her to the hospital or call 911. Head down with rear end up in the air, legs open. That way, if the, the umbilical cord has not pulled through, you know, with that gush of water, it'll stay inside with gravity. But if her legs are open and it has descended down, that'll keep it pulsating. You call 911, they're going to give you some very specific instructions on what to do in this case. The baby has a very small window of time. Okay. Fetal malpresentation. This is shoulder transverse. This is a position that sometimes a woman labors and she only gets so far and she stops dilating. It's called failure to progress. They check it out and they find out there's no presenting part putting pressure on the cervix, allowing it to continue to dilate. Here, fetal distress. Now, when you have a contraction, it's normal for the baby's heart rate to drop because of what's happening. It's being squeezed. So when the contraction's over, we want the heart rate to come back up. If the heart rate does not recover when the contraction is over, that's considered fetal distress. Now sometimes they can try some things, change your position, give some oxygen, increase fluids. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And they'll decide one way or the other if they need to do a cesarean. Placenta previa, this is not a surprise, okay? Uh, many women with a 
uh, placenta previa, their pregnancy may begin with a little bit of bleeding, some spotting. They do an ultrasound, and they find that that placenta is embedded over the cervical opening. Now, some point in their pregnancy, some women, their placenta will gravitate up and move out of the way. Sometimes it will not. And that uh, is reason why they may have to give birth by cesarean. If it stays down there, there's no way. Placental abruption. I mentioned this earlier. If you have localized pain with or without bleeding, the placenta is breaking away from the uterine wall prematurely. And then CPD, cephalopelvic disproportion. Fancy words meaning the baby's head's too big to fit, or it could be um, the size of the pelvis or the shape of the pelvis that will not accommodate the baby's head. And then other indications, previous cesarean section, multiple gestations, twins, triplets, genital active herpes, and then HIV. Um, these are all situations that may end up indicating cesarean birth. And this uh, chart shows variations in presentations. This is a vertex head down position. This is the position we want the baby to be in. And this one, these three down here, are breech presentations. This is a complete breech, which is rear end first. The arms and legs are, are flexed, they're bent. It's just kind of sitting there. Footling breech, a leg hanging down, or frank breech, which is rear end first. In a, a, a breech frank position, the baby has been sitting like this. And some of these poor little guys, they come out, they put them on the table, they try to stretch their legs out, and they go bing, they go back again, because they've been sitting so long in that position. So some of them might have hip dysplasia or some other issues, or some just need to relax. So that's an issue there. Now, two very good reasons why they would prefer not to deliver baby vaginally in a breech presentation is the fact that when we give birth to our babies, okay, this part of the head is the part that molds. In a breech presentation, the body is expelled. If the head's inside, the next pre presenting part could be the chin. It can get stuck. That's one of the issues. The other issues, when we give birth to our baby, there are a certain shade of blue or purple. So the air hits their body, <gasps> they take the breath, and they start to cry. Their body begins to pink up. In a breech presentation, if the body is expelled and the head is inside, if the air is allowed to get to the baby's body, they take the breath, <gasps> and then all those fluids go down into the lungs and can cause a bad infection. So those are two very good reasons why we don't want to birth a baby in a breech presentation if it's... Um, preventable. Face brow, this is also called military position. That baby's head is pushed up against that pubic bone. That would also be considered failure to progress as well. And then here, shoulder transverse, that was the same one that was on the other, the previous poster. So whether you labor and your labor ends in a cesarean birth or maybe it's a straight cesarean, maybe at the end of your pregnancy they decide, okay, this baby's breech, we have to plan a cesarean birth. Um, can go a couple different ways. First of all, they still need to prep you, just like they would with a regular birth, but with some other things added to it. They're going to have you um, remove contact lenses, glasses, piercings, false teeth, and jewelry. Okay. They're going to shave you from here to mid-pubic area. They will put a catheter into your bladder. They're going to get an IV started. They're going to have you swallow an antacid that's very bitter. Just guzzle it down. It's to prevent you from vomiting. They're going to give you a cap for your hair. And then once they're ready, they're going to take you over to the sur surgical area. In that area, that's where a partner will get their scrubs. They'll give them a cap. They'll give them a mask. Don't put the mask on while you're sitting there waiting, because it might be a while before you have to go in. And I call this point the holding pattern. I would really encourage you to do some slow paced breathing while you're waiting at that time because that's where the nerves start to settle in. You're having major surgery, but you're giving birth. So if you do some of that slow paced breathing, it might be able to calm you down a little bit. When they're ready to take her in, they're going to take her in. Partners, you will still wait outside while they're finishing up with her, uh, her prep work. Okay? If she has had an epidural for labor and the labor ends in a cesarean, they will just increase her epidural. If she prefers to stay awake, then they will give her a spinal. And similar to the epidural, but it's one shot, gives a denser coverage, but only lasts about two hours. So they would do that instead. Um, if she does not want to be awake, if she's really nervous and it's, it's really affecting her, they can give her general anesthesia. But they would prefer her to be awake. She'll heal better. She'll heal faster if she is awake. 
So once they've done her prep work, they're going to take her in, lie her back on the table. Her arms will be stretched out. They'll put a drape in front of her face to form a sterile shield. And your body kind of goes through some, several changes with that medication. It kind of goes tingly, warm, numb, heavy, and then whoa. Many people, especially with a, with a spinal, feel very detached from their upper part of their body and their lower part of their body. Okay? And um, sometimes you get an unusual feeling like you can't breathe. You are breathing, but you don't feel the breathing movements. So if you tell the anesthesiologist, they can help you with that. Now, there's going to be several people in the room, and they all have very specific jobs. The anesthesiologist stays right by your head, monitors your vitals. You have your doctor, another doctor working with them, a couple nurses working with them. You have a nurse that has a tray of instruments that she's counting everything. And we also have someone from the neonatal intensive care unit just to have on hand in case of an emergency. And there may be someone observing. Okay. So once you have the medication in place, your partner will be allowed into the room. And they can stay right by your head, just like that. And you can talk to them. Hi, sweetie. How are you doing? OK. But um, if you want to take pictures, um, you have that opportunity. Some people don't want to see what's going on on the other side. But sometimes morbid curiosity takes over, and you just want to look. So they'll say, OK, come so far, but don't touch anything that's blue. You can snap some pictures, but if you start to feel odd, and you're not sure what you're feeling, just sit down. Just back your way up because we don't want you to get hurt. Okay. Now, once the medication has taken effect, then they're going to pinch or poke your lower abdominal area to make sure it is numb. Now, sometimes you feel the pressure, but you don't feel the pinch. Okay. If you feel anything at all, you let them know. Now, your, your doctor will determine what type of incision that will be made. Um, there's two basic incisions. The midline cut, cut, which is straight up and down from the, the belly button down, or the low transverse bikini cut. It's about this long, down underneath the pubic hairline, and um, they'll make the decision at the time. And um, if you may know your mom, your grandma, somebody that had to have every baby born by cesarean, it's usually because of that midline cut, straight up and down. That type of cut would not, would not withstand labor as a higher chance of rupturing open. So from that point, every baby has to be born by cesarean. But if they do the low transverse bikini cut on the outside of the, uh, the belly and the uterus, then you have the opportunity to have a VBAC, which is a vaginal birth after cesarean, as long as the pre-existing uh, problem is no longer there. So if you decide a couple years from now you want to have another baby, and you can bring it up to your, your caregiver that you would like to try a VBAC, they'll let you know your options for that. Okay, so they make several incisions to get down to where the baby's at. Once they get down to the uterus, they do that. They break the water. You might feel a little bit of tugging and pulling. And then, the, oh, it's a boy, it's a girl. They might hold it over the little uh, drape for you to see. And then they're going to take it over to the side to do a quick pediatric check. Now, at some point, partners, you're going to follow the baby into the nursery where they will continue those, uh, those uh, procedures on the baby where mom, she'll be there for about another 30 minutes of them finishing up. From the start to the end, the whole process takes about an hour. Um, but from that point, about another 30 minutes of them stitching, cleaning, they uh, take the uterus out, clean it, cauterize it, put it back in, and then from the outside or the inside out, on the outside you might have staples or sutures, depending on what your doctor chooses to use. Um, at that point, it's normal to have a little bit of shaking or nausea or vomiting. They can help you with that. They can give you medication. And once they have everything taken care of, they take you into the to recovery time where you'll be maybe an hour or two. At some point, the baby will be brought back in there. And if, you're, uh, if you've had the spinal or the epidural and you're fully awake, you can begin that skin-to-skin -skin bonding time. You can put the baby on the breast, get the latch going, and then once they're ready, they'll get you situated in your room. With a cesarean birth, you're in the hospital for three to four days. With a vaginal birth, it's usually 48 hours. Now, when it comes to recovery time with your cesarean, um, you need to be aware that you will be in bed for about 24 hours. And then when that 24-hour period ends, they will remove your IV, take out your catheter, and do some very specific things to get you up and walking. At some point, they're going to give you an, an abdominal binder. 
It comes underneath your rear end, comes around the front, attaches, and helps keep that incision stabilized. If at any point you feel like you're going to cough or sneeze or giggle, pull your knees up and just support it a little bit more to make it feel better. When the nurse um, wants you to get out of bed and begin to walk, you will not want to do it. You're going to feel like you're 85 years old and you weigh 500 pounds from the waist down and you're going to hurt. But the sooner you get moving, the better off you're going to heal. Now when she gets you out of bed, you may have to physically pull your legs to the side of the bed this way and then just kind of scoot your rear end up. And then once you get to that sitting position, just wait a little bit. Just relax, take a couple deep breaths. And then once she wants you to stand up, you will have to hold on to the bed rail, your partner or your nurse for leverage. You're going to be very weak and wobbly. So. Once when you finally do stand up, you're going to stop about here. You're not going to be able to stand up all the way. Okay? You get to this point, wait until the room stops spinning before you walk. Now, she may want you to walk to the bathroom. It might be 10 feet. It will feel like 50. So this is about as fast as you'll be walking. Now, if you start to feel lightheaded at any point, she can slide the chair right underneath your rear end. You can sit down and wait a little bit. Once you get into the restroom, you may be able to go. You may not be able to go because of catheters, medications. It may um, reduce that, that ability to urinate. You sit there for a while. Then you get up. You come back. You get back into the bed or the chair. Now, if you feel comfortable, you can use the restroom from that point on. If not, they can bring a bedpan in. Now, don't try to be super person. They're going to give you medications for pain. Take it on a regular basis because muscles heal when they're relaxed. If you tr wait too long to take the pain medication, it doesn't work as well as it would if you take it on a regular basis. It won't hurt the baby with breastfeeding. Um, they're also going to give you medication for gas because that's one of the issues with abdominal surgery. And I've seen women blow up with a ring. They're so full of gas. So one way to help with that is to walk. You put your robe, slippers on, put the baby in the bassinet, and you can walk down the hallway to help get rid of the gas. Now, if you start to walk and you're, you're putt-putting behind you, don't be embarrassed. The nurses will be happy. Oh, yeah, good for you. Like, quick, run away. Now, if you're in your room and you have visitors there and you need to let it go, let it go. You'll feel so much better. You don't want to hold that back. That's just part of the process. Um, when you go home, you're going to need help. If you have a two-story home, we really prefer you stay downstairs the first week or two. If you can't do that, if you don't have an extra bed or a lousy couch, then you go up at night, you come down in the morning, you cannot go up and down the stairs all day long. You're going to avoid them. Uh, the only thing you can hold is your baby, and they're going to help you in the hospital with positions for breastfeeding to keep the baby off your tummy. Um, if you have stairs, a better way to go up the stairs is to hold the railing and go up backwards to keep the stress off that incision site. Uh, warning signs would be on the incision would be if the area becomes swollen, puffy, if anything's oozing from the site, if it's swollen, looks purple underneath, or if you're running a fever, if there's an odor, you need to let your doctor know. Um, the nurse will instruct you on to keep the area clean and dry, but these are things you're going to look for when you go home. So you got to take it easy. You've given birth and you've had major surgery. And some women have a difficult time if they end up giving birth by cesarean. And you need to know partners to be sympathetic. Let her talk until she can't talk about it anymore. Because for some women, it is difficult. Others, it's just another way to give birth. I say, thank goodness there's another exit. Um, because if there weren't, my son wouldn't be here. But some people do have a difficult time, so we take it one step at a time. Uh -huh. Postpartum care. What to expect from your body physically, uh, with her emotionally, after she gives birth to her baby, um, starting from the top down. When it comes to your breasts, you may have been told by a a friend, a family member, somebody, that you need to prepare your breast for breastfeeding. Um, but you don't need to do that. Some people believe you need to take a wet washcloth and rough up your nipples for a couple weeks prior to giving birth because they believe 
that by doing so, it'll toughen up your nipples, and by the time this baby's here, you put the baby on, it will no longer hurt. Now, there's several things that's wrong with this idea. Nipple stimulation causes the uterus to contract, and it can cause dangerous contractions, which we nickname titanic contractions. Secondly, that area of the body, which is the nipple in the areola, is comprised of erectile tissue. You cannot toughen erectile tissue. You can damage it, but you can't toughen it. Thirdly, there's little nodules around your areola area called Montgomery glands that serve two very specific purposes. One is it secretes an oil that keeps that area, the, the nipple, supple, and it secretes a fragrance that is similar to the amniotic fluid that your baby's floating around in now, and it actually attracts them to the breast. So when you bathe or shower, warm water, let your body air dry, don't scrub your breasts, that's all you need to do. What will prevent sore nipples is correct position and latch, so you don't need to prepare them, okay? Going from here to here. Wherever that placenta was attached, it's now detached. You have a tissue fluff off, it's called lochia, that goes through several color changes. It grows bright red, pink, brown, clear. If you've been doing a lot around the house and your, uh, the color changes have been brown and gone back to bright red, that's a signal you're doing too much. You need to sit down, put your feet up, because you can begin to hemorrhage, okay? But the bleeding itself will last, the heaviest part is the first seven days, and then after that it lightens up, but it could last for several weeks. In the hospital, they'll give you things for that. They will give you pads, and they're going to give you these big packages of pads to help with that. And they're going to give you these beautiful underwear, these wonderful one-size-fits-most underwear. <laughs> they're very comfortable, they're granny-looking, but they serve a purpose. What we're going to have you do is we're going to have you put two pads in here, side by side. You pull these on, and it helps keep the pads in place. If you filled both of these pads in a one-hour period, that's too much bleeding. Let your nurse know. But it's very common to have blood clots. As the week goes on, they should get smaller and smaller. You'll see them in the toilet. You'll see them on your pad, okay? But pretty typical. Now, I suggest every time you go to the store, you buy a package of pads because you're going to go through several packages by the time you're done. You're not going to want to send your partner out to the store at 10 o'clock on their cell phone looking at all the pads saying, oh, you know, always stay free, wings. What do you need wings for, okay? You want to have them at the house. So you have your pads, and they'll give you everything you need for that. If you have had an episiotomy or some lacerations, they're going to give you one of these, and it's called a peri bottle. Keep it in your bathroom, fill it with warm water, put the lid on, you do your business, and you're going to spritz all the debris out with that, dab it dry. Once you've done your business and you've cleaned that area, then you're going to have witch hazel pads you can put on your pads wherever the, uh, the um, sutures have been placed. And these sutures, if there has been an episiotomy, are dissolvable. And they'll begin to dissolve and fall out, usually within 12, 15 days or so. But the issue is when they begin to heal, that's when they start to itch and burn. Okay, so there's a product you can get called Dermaplast Spray. I call it the Freeze It, Numbs It Spray. You can get it anywhere. They sell Band-Aids. And keep it in your diaper bag because you can be out somewhere and they'll begin to heal and you'll be very uncomfortable. And you spray it and it freezes everything, helps it to feel better. Um, if you need to, you can take pain medication. It won't hurt the baby at all. And then just sometimes that's a signal to stop and put your feet up and just kind of take some time to take a break. Emotionally, she can go through some changes. Now, baby blues is normal. Depression is not normal. Um, three, four days after you have the baby, when your breast milk starts to come in, you have a hormonal upsurge. And she may begin to be weepy and crying. And partners, you could be looking at her going, why are you doing this? The baby's out. But it has to do with that hormonal upsurge. It has to do learning how to breastfeed, having a new baby in the house. There's a lot of issues. So baby blues is typical. It may last a few days to a week. But if it becomes to the extremes. Um, either she's sleeping too much or not sleeping enough, eating too much, not eating enough. She feels very detached from her baby. She may not call it by name. She may call it it or refer to it as it. Um, this is a situation that is not normal. Um, she may feel very inadequate in her, in her ability to take care of her baby. Partners, if you see this, when the baby's sleeping, approach her 
talk to her lovingly, and both of you go to the doctor together. Moms, if you feel this in yourself, don't be ashamed. It's not your fault. It's a hormonal imbalance. You both go to the doctor together, and you will need treatment. You can't ignore depression. It will not go away. It needs to be treated. Um, and then you can enjoy your baby at that point. So if you feel this, take the time to get it taken care of so you can um, enjoy your baby. Once you give birth to your baby, your doctor will give you typically a six-week rule for healing uh, with, its, uh, with a vaginal birth. If it's a cesarean birth, they'll give you about an eight-week rule. And, um, but partners, it may be a while before she is interested in having relations again. It may be physically or it may be emotionally. So I always suggest that after the dust clears, about four weeks, five weeks after the baby's born, give her two days a week where she can have three to four hours to herself. She can hand the baby over to you. You're not babysitting. You're being a dad. And you can bond with your baby, and she can do whatever she needs to do to recharge her batteries. She can take a nap. She can go to lunch. She can go to the movies. She can soak in a tub, whatever she needs. I guarantee if you give her that time, she's going to be a much better partner to you and a, and a much better mom to this baby. Okay? So we cannot read minds. Moms, if you are exhausted and you need help, let your partner know, I need help. Partners, don't wait for her to beg. Pick up the slack. Do some laundry. Wash some dishes. And when the, the dust clears, when everything starts to settle down again, she may be physically healed, but she may not be emotionally ready to have sex, but it's up to her. It can be a few weeks. It can be a few months. But what you need to be aware is, uh, about is the physical changes your body goes through after you've given birth. If you've had an episiotomy, if you've had lacerations, it may be very uncomfortable to resume relations again. When you're breastfeeding, it dries up the vaginal walls, so you may need another lubricant. Um, so some things to kind of be aware of. Uh, maybe you decide you want to uh, continue with your relations, and it may be very uncomfortable for her. You may need to be creative in positioning because of the healing process. Because if there has been a tear there, scar tissue is there, and scar tissue doesn't stretch. So she may, need, she may be very uncomfortable. Um, when you're breastfeeding, and you become sexually excited, your breast milk can leak or spray. Now, if dad is curious about breast milk, it won't hurt anything. It'll just increase the supply. But if it bothers him, put in some breast pads and a bra. You got it taken care of. But these are things you have to look forward to to be aware of. And remember, if it's uncomfortable to have relations, there's other ways of showing affection. Hugging, kissing, remember what brought the two of you together because it re you really need to make an effort. Um, to keep your relationship going once a baby comes into the picture. So take time to have a date night. Um, it's okay for baby to spend time with grandma or somebody else. And um, just focus on your relationship at least once or twice a month to keep it going. But these are things you need to be aware of. Besides the, the warning signs of preeclampsia, I want to throw some other ones in there. Okay, vomiting. Uh, the problem is if you're vomiting too much, you can become dehydrated. And dehydration is a good way to put yourself into preterm labor. So if you're vomiting to an extent, you need to call your doctor and see what's going on. Okay. Um, bleeding is never acceptable in a pregnancy. Now at this point, if you were to have intercourse or an internal exam by your doctor, it's normal to have a little bit of spotting. But if there's enough blood to where you need to wear a pad, you need to see your doctor. They may just send you right over to the hospital, okay? But you do definitely need to be seen, okay? Um, infection is one of those ways that a lot of women go into preterm labor, and typical infections are urinary tract infections, bladder infections. So if you have decreased urination or painful urination, you need to see your doctor, okay? Um, and then along with the movement, we want to make sure we're paying attention to the movement of the baby as well. Now, localized pain, here, here, or here, sharp, not going away, with or without bleeding, you need to be seen, because that can be a brutal placenta. Any type of pain that doesn't go away within about 30 minutes to an hour, you need to have it checked out. Now, sometimes it can be a gas bubble, you know, but we need to know. And again, if they check it out and it ends up being nothing, perfectly fine. Don't be embarrassed. You're not wasting their time. This is 
again, so many bizarre things. With your first baby, you don't know if what you're experiencing is normal or not. So you need to have those answers so you feel more comfortable. Thank <laughs> you.